what are you guys doing? Oh, that looks pretty good. <laughs> so they're making llamas out of dough. The doughy llama. That's uh, right. Yeah. That's what I was saying. It came to me, right. So put your hands together for Tony Shea. So, downtown Las Vegas has changed a lot, but I wanted to kind of just walk through the last couple of years. This, okay. is your, this is your avatar. Anyway, so this is going to be your story. So we are going to start, uh, let's start over here at the Ogden. We'll put you right in front of it. So I want to just kind of rewind time and talk about uh, when did you first discover the Ogden? When did you decide to move in? Uh, so, let's see, uh, I moved into the Ogden, which is where we are right now, about uh, two and a half years ago. And I think when I first moved in, it was uh, less than 20% occupied, but in the year or so prior to that, I had been hanging out around downtown a lot, especially at Downtown Cocktail Room. I oh, uh, met gotcha. Michael Cornthwaite and, uh, and actually saw Emergency Arts and the Bee Coffee House before they even built anything out, uh, and then saw that come to fruition. So uh, I know it just felt right to move. OK, through. so I, because I was thinking this was the start, but may, we'll make this the DCR. So this is, so the first thing was hanging out at the DCR, and you kind of started to get to know that culture. That's what attracted you to downtown in the first place? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it was actually Michael. It, we would hang out there uh, several times a week. And and actually, this we started hanging out there before there was any even any idea of Zappos moving to downtown. And uh, gotcha. uh, we'd actually been looking for the past seven or eight years to build a permanent pl permanent campus somewhere. Michael's uh, very persistent, very passionate, very convincing. And uh, the more he talked to us, the more he convinced us that maybe we should take a different approach than other kind of typical corporate campuses. And, and over time, we actually decided, well, actually, I, th I think he's right. Maybe we should actually turn the entire concept inside out. Because those other campuses, you know, Apple, Nike, Google, were great for employees, but didn't really right. integrate or contribute to the community around them. And we started shifting our thinking to, what if we built a campus that was more analogous to NYU, where the campus kind of blends in with the community, and you don't really know where one begins or the other ends, and where Zappos employees would actually be encouraged to go out into the community, and we would encourage community folks to come into the campus and, and really have, uh, I guess that's kind of where the whole idea of uh, collisions started happening. How gotcha. do we get more collisions between, uh, in, initially it was just driven by uh, the need of a Zappos campus, and this was all before the whole idea of downtown project even started. So um, what about uh, Ed Glazer's book, Triumph of the City? So you talk about that a lot in some of your presentations and how that influenced you, and especially the statistic that I've heard you cite a couple times about how dense populations in cities are more productive and then in work environments sometimes they're less. Was, the, was that kind of thought also swirling around in your head at these late night DCR shindigs? Uh, not initially, but then as the idea of possibly moving downtown, and I didn't even know the former city hall was going to become available, but once we found oh, that, was it, it still, was it still City Hall at that point? It was, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's and, still and, and I don't watch TV, so I didn't even know if the city was building a new City Hall. Yeah. And uh, but as we discovered that it was actually a real possibility, started reading more books, including Triumph of the City. Uh, and it turns out the author's a Harvard economics professor. That uh, it's it's actually a really interesting book. Uh, would recommend even for people that aren't involved in urban revival, revitalization, because he studied cities from all different time periods, like Rome, New York, Detroit, and looked at why some thrived and some didn't. And actually, a lot of the findings that he cites in the book are uh, really counterintuitive, and, and including the statistic that uh, every time the size of a city doubles, innovation and productivity per resident increases by 15%. And so that actually uh, started making the business case from the Zappos perspective for why we gotcha. should move downtown uh, in addition to all the other community stuff that we were thinking about. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move your avatar over here to the Emergency Arts Building, if you don't mind just me grabbing your head like that. Um, now, here we are at the <laughs> Emergency Arts. Now, I wanted to maybe talk now about the user lib. So I wasn't, uh, I've never quite understood the whole story of where it came from. And if you could just kind of explain how it came into fruition. And for everybody, the user lib is a place that's right up, right on the same block. And it's originally, it was kind of like work in progress. It was a co-working space. It seems to also be a kind of a creative space and all in one kind of library thing. Yeah, and so that was something that was originally Pavel's idea. Where's Pavel? 
That was Pavel's oh. idea? You didn't know this? The whole time we were setting this up, you didn't say anything to me? <laughs> Jeez, you know he spent he, he spent like his entire week printing out all these three D things at this tin shop, and I uh, yeah no that's actually sure. Pavel right there yeah <laughs> so um no uh, no no I have other characters we can use so we have Pavel now here too okay so so this was actually right before Downtown Project was officially formed and so Pavel emailed me uh, and had this idea for a tech library and uh, and initially there were no funds for anything and. Uh, and, and so to build the initial tech library, uh, Zappos was actually the one that funded the initial, uh, basically it was Zappos' contribution to uh, this idea of a community uh, tech library that got the oh, initial okay. uh, whole, thing, whole thing going. So did it ever feel like an experiment in your head? Like could it have played out in different ways where you might have lost interest in downtown early on? I mean, for me yeah. personally, I had already been hanging out there for about a year or so, and, and the thought actually never even crossed my mind from the Zappos perspective to, okay. to, to do that there. But then on the Zappos end, it's complicated because we're now actually wholly owned by Amazon, and so we can't actually go around uh, doing anything that's not directly related to online retailing. And so oh. that's actually, because of that constraint, that's actually what uh, uh, oh. kind of, that's how Downtown Project was born, was really to do the things that were just really difficult under the Zappos umbrella. To oh, that's interesting. So without the Amazon acquisition, there wouldn't, like, this probably just would still be a big Zappos project? You don't think it would have been privately funded? Uh, I think it's really hard to say because it was Amazon acquiring Zappos that provided the liquidity for okay, the downtown right. project to, to do stuff, so it's, so it's also a little bit chicken in and egg yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll leave Pavel over here to steal some more shelving. Let's move you over to <laughs> work in progress here. So tell me a little bit about how this came to fruition and um, the story behind it. Uh, so there's a guy named Zach Ware who worked at Zappos uh, at the time, and he was actually in charge of our website. And when we decided we were going to move into the former city hall, uh, just in our conversations, it became clear that he really understood a lot of the concepts that we cared about, including uh, it's less about how pretty the building is or uh, it, you know, how uh, great the inside finishes were, and it's really more about how do we get employees to collide, how do we get employees to uh, go out into the community, how do, how do we essentially increase the number of collisions. And we actually talked to a lot of different people, a lot of different architects, and uh, I think that's a really hard concept for most uh, people to wrap their minds around when they're, for, for people that come from a kind of a traditional architecture background. Uh, and so for whatever reason, uh, Zach and I really connected and he got that. So we actually took him off of what I would say is probably Zappos's most important priority, the website, and had him focus on really helping build out the campus because campus this was such an yeah. important part and we wanted to make sure uh, we did it right. After that was done, uh, he had separately launched Work in Progress uh, and, and now is CEO of Project 100 uh, and so is actually no longer a Zappos employee but focused on th these parts. But, it, but it's all centers around uh, building community and building collisions. You think you'd be very happy exactly Zach where? Where? Uh, Campus development, Project 100. <laughs> get, his, get his coffee cup in there. Yeah. Yes. I know it doesn't even look like a Lego head, but <coughs> came in the package. Okay, so let's move you um, next over to, let's see, let me think through my head. Was Learning Village or Gold Spike next? I guess it's probably Gold Spike, right? I think so. Okay, so we'll move you over here to the Gold Spike now. Uh, yeah, so Gold Spike used to be this uh, old smoky casino, and we acquired downtown project acquired in May, and um, and then we basically took out all the gaming and replaced it with real life games, and so we had um, over oversized uh, Jenga and oversized right. cornhole <laughs> and uh, oversized Connect Four and so on, and and basically Makes our you feel goal. Tiny. Uh, it doesn't make me feel tiny, yeah. but, um, sure, you're, you're but if it complaint. makes you feel tiny, that's <laughs> fine. Sure, okay, okay, um, all right. Jeez, so, can't no, catch a break with No, that's thing. cool. And so um, we just wanted it to be fun. We didn't uh, think it would make you feel tiny. So, um, and, and, But it was one of those things where our goal was to, and, and I remember the headlines when we announced that we were taking out the gaming. Uh, 
uh, there were a lot of media headlines that, that were like, oh, that'll never work, and so on. And, and we had actually no proof for, uh, you know, in tech terms, MVP that, that it would work, but it was more just something that just felt right. Oh, right. And it was one of those things where it wasn't like there was one uh, designer or architect that figured everything out. The really cool thing about it was just different people threw in different ideas and we're like, all right, let's try, see what giant beer pong looks like, or, right. <laughs> or now there's a skating rink outside, or, and, and, and so on. And so, uh, and it's been kind of cool. And, and it's, I think one of the most unexpected things from that, uh, compared to what we originally thought would happen, was by day, daytime, it's kind of like this really cool casual co-working space. Yeah, it is. And, and I've gone in there where there's just laptops lined around all the bar area, and and, and then by night, it, and then it kind of transitions into this hangout happy hour lounge, and then like today's uh, Thursday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, there's live bands outside, and and uh, and now there's actually people living in the former hotel rooms that got renovated, and all of those things just kind of evolved very uh, organically and naturally. And, and that's part of the reason why I, I really like it. Like, it just too, feels yeah. comfortable to hang yeah, out. Yeah, I would right? say, in my opinion, this is, out of all the properties, I think this is the, my very favorite one. And, and then we did things that, at the time, were super controversial and had to fight for, like, uh, on the corner of, because um, the main entrance is actually on Ogden between uh, 3rd and 4th, right? And, oh, okay. and yeah. which is actually not the normal main door. Like, there's a big corner door on, I think it's 4th Street, uh, which we actually made the decision to shut down. And the reason we did that was this whole idea of getting collisions. And, and now it seems no one even gives a second thought to that. <laughs> but, but there were actually a lot of uh, uh, people that felt very strongly about, oh, we should have as many doors as possible. Uh, but part of the cool thing is it also enables this uh, one of our goals with downtown projects is to have this ongoing sense of discovery. So we know there's stories of people that go into Gold Spike for the first time. They kind of stumble into it, uh, and maybe they go by day and they think that's all it is. And then a separate time they go right. at night, and then they don't even realize there's a backyard. And then oh, when yeah. they go to the backyard, maybe two or three times later. And so every time there's something, uh, there's a black light room yeah. that, that that's evolved. Yeah, that's and, and so. Uh, one of the things I really like about Gold Spike is it really plays into this ongoing sense of uh, discovery for most people. Yeah, sorry to make you so tired, but you got to walk all the way down Fremont over here, <laughs> the Learning Village. So, uh, so I'm actually uh, I attend the um, board meetings for Meetup.com, mm -hmm. and then also Vegas Tech Fund is a shareholder in Skillshare. And in talking to both of those companies, ask them what their biggest challenges were because they're focused on building gathering points, meeting spots, uh, learning locations for uh, cities all around the world and neighborhoods all around the world. And they said their biggest uh, challenge was actually the venue challenge. And there's so many communities around the world where uh, there's people that are passionate about something but just didn't have a good venue to meet at. And, and so we actually don't own the land to Learning Village. And so uh, it's built out of trailers because we just wanted to throw up something quick. Uh, you know, and, and this was before Container Park and uh, a lot of other places were, were open <coughs> where people could meet. And we've had different speaker series and, and so on. And so uh, it's a semi-temporary, semi-permanent um, project. But because we don't own the land, uh, you know, chances are those trailers are going to move at, at some point. But, oh, that's but it was a way yeah, to realize. kind of jumpstart things and help accelerate things. Yeah, because I mean, when we first came, the, the UNLV president was basically giving talks at the user lib, which just you yeah. can fit the amount of people. Well, and the, it moved well at the very beginning, it was actually yeah. out of my apartment oh. upstairs, <laughs> and like literally the size of, of, of this room. And, uh, and then we outgrew that and then you know, tried some other locations and outgrew that. And it's cool because we've had like all sorts of great speakers like the co-CEO of Whole Foods come oh, yeah. and speak, or Morgan Spurlock, and, and so on, and, and they've been speaking at the Morgan, at, at the, at, sorry, at the Learning Village, and uh, you know now some of those events, it's several hundred people, and it also gets and simulcast into the other uh, trailers there when we run out of room. Yeah, I will say the, the speaker series is absolutely my favorite reason for living downtown okay so i'm going to take you i guess over to zappos yeah quickly. so we're completely moved in now uh it took us a, a period of a couple months to move in uh, we actually had the grand opening uh ribbon cutting there where we actually set a new world record i don't know if you yeah it was, uh, okay. i mean we actually had a ribbon that was over a mile long 
and then over 1,500 pairs of scissors, or and 1,500 people there simultaneously cutting the ribbon. So the record was for the most number of people simultaneously yeah, cutting that was the ribbon. Quite the scene. Uh, and then yeah. someone decided it would be a good idea to have a happy hour with 1,500 <laughs> pairs of scissors running around. But um, <laughs> it worked out. Uh, and, yeah, so um, it, the, the walls still aren't, because we moved from Henderson where we'd been for seven or eight years, and so uh, we have all sorts of decorations there. So it's still a work in progress in getting our new headquarters uh, up to the Zappos feel. Yeah, yeah, I went to the door recently. It seems like you're getting there pretty quick, though. It's had a lot of personality already, I thought. Um, okay, so this is this is for Life is Beautiful. Uh, that was just one of those things where uh, someone, a, a guy named Rehan, uh, founder of Life is Beautiful, had this absolutely crazy idea. His idea was to fence off 15 blocks. Uh, Which one do you like for Rehan? Both are pretty odd. That one. <laughs> okay, that's uh, be Rehan. Okay. Yeah, so, so his idea was to actually uh, do four festivals in one. A uh, music festival, we had 65 bands, including The Killers, Imagine Dragons, Beck, and, and so on. Um, we had, uh, and then it was its own culinary festival with 50 celebrity chefs. Uh, it was its own uh, learning festival, and it was its own uh, arts festival where I, I think something like 16 murals went up, and most of those are still remaining, so that's kind of cool that they remained after the festival. And, and then, on top of that, he, he uh, decided to fence off 15 city blocks, which has never been done before in any city, so it's almost like South by Southwest meets Coachella, and we ended up having 60,000 people yeah, attend amazing. over two days, uh, and uh, I've been to a lot of festivals, and, and it, it was definitely one of the top festivals I've ever yeah, been Yeah, it was to. uniquely downtown, too. I liked it. <laughs> hey, anybody go to Life is Beautiful? Yeah. 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 Okay, so our last stop on this tour is uh, the Container Park. So give me the rundown of where that idea came from and how it came into fruition. Uh, it's one of those things that just kind of, uh, like, kind of like the Gold Spike, where it was just different people throwing in different ideas. And now there's 40-something um, small businesses, all local there. In some ways, it's kind of like a small business incubator where they can test out ideas, and if they do well, then maybe get a bigger, more permanent location somewhere. Uh, and one of the th one of our goals uh, with that was, you know, prior to that, you didn't really see a lot of kids or family around downtown. Right. There's a giant treehouse and slide in there, and uh, it's just a really <coughs> cool vibe. We had to do a lot of things that were that had never been done, done before in the city, like figuring out how to stack containers and these modular cube structures. And one of our biggest challenges was if it's if there's alcohol involved, then it's an adult thing, and if there's slides involved, then it's a kids only thing. And um, <laughs> we You're like alcohol and slides. Well, we wanted we wanted something where the adult. Actually, it's been interesting because uh, a lot a lot of adults have actually gone down this slide. That's 40 uh, feet up there, and uh, I think half of them scream. Um, <laughs> one of them may have been you, and so uh, I just felt so tiny. Yes. I felt so tiny yes. in that thing. It freaked me out. But but the whole vibe we were looking to create was the idea of like Im imagine a backyard barbecue pool party where kids are having fun, but adults are also enjoying a beer or oh, two yeah, yeah. and hanging out with the adults' friends, knowing that their kids are safe. And so that was the vibe that we were trying to create for uh, for Container Park. And, and so it's been pretty cool just seeing uh, families show up and, and kids show up, but also adults show up and not feel like, oh, this is a kids-only place or, or vice versa. We, well, I wanted to talk about the, the possible scenario of some kind of a monster coming out of Lake Mead. Really just how cool that movie would be if it was destroying the city. If this comes up, does the downtown project have any ability to stop him? Or is there anything we could do before he eats up all of the important things? I don't know. All, all I can say is that that monster makes <laughs> you look really tiny. <laughs> Well, luckily, you're on the podcast crew here. We've devised a plan to save this city. Don't worry about it. Bring up the lawn.
promise for judging. And right, remember the one. All right, now we got Lise. I'm a llama, not a dinosaur. <laughs> So make sure this is an important decision because one of them will win a free beer. <laughs> um, so take it easy. I'm going to have to go with, well, the first one actually looks like a white donkey and made, <laughs> and made a white donkey noise. So I'm going to have to go with the second one. Vegas, we the hardest, hardest, yeah, yeah. Our ride, our ride is downtown, we running this. Let's the y'all just running less. Creeping on and come up to make sure we in this bitch. Tweet to your followers, remember like a flashback. Vegas tech, don't forget to spell it with the hashtag.